Hi, it's Mark Bowdis. This episode marks a milestone for the Agent of Wealth podcast. It's the 100th episode. I started this podcast back in 2018, and since then, I've covered a variety of financial topics, ranging from investment strategies to retirement preparedness to charitable giving, and a lot of other topics maybe you wouldn't expect a financial advisor to discuss, like how to solve sleep issues or how to declutter your home. Over the course of the 100 episodes, I've had 61 guests on the show, including current and former colleagues. They've all brought unique perspectives and knowledge, and I'm grateful for all who have made the time to join me. If you enjoy listening to the show, I'd love to hear what your favorite episode has been. Drop the podcast a review and let me know. Now back to the Agent of Wealth. Welcome to the Agent of Wealth podcast with Mark Boudis from Boudis Financial. In this podcast, Mark helps guide you towards financial freedom, ensure you never run out of money, and create a balance in life that prioritizes what is most important to you. Join us for this journey as Mark draws from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the multiple wealth building challenges involved in your financial life. Welcome back to the Agent of Wealth. This is your host, Mark Bowdis. On today's show, we brought on the Bowdis Financial Team to discuss the book, Animal Spirits, How Human Psychology Drives the Economy and Why It Matters for Global Capitalism by George Ekerloff and Robert Schiller. <laughs> Kayla, you picked this one, and I'm going to turn over the discussion to you, and maybe you can start off with just a quick summary of the book and why you picked it. Thanks, Mark. Sounds good. I picked the book, Animal Spirits by George Ekerloff and Robert Schiller. And George Akerlof is a Nobel Prize winner. Robert Schiller is a Yale professor. And in the book, they discuss how human psychology drives markets. And the book came out right after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And they um, used the term animal spirits from John Keynes, who was an economist during the 1930s, right after the Great Depression. And he, Keynes used the phrase to describe how um, psychology drives the human economy and how people don't always behave in the matter that's predicted. I think that a good quote from the book that sums up this concept goes, people have non-economic motives and they're not always rational. And in the book, Akerlof and Schiller argue that um, traditional economic theory places too much weight on the quantifiable facts, so like numbers and that type of thing, and not enough on human emotion. And they also emphasize that it's important that government can intervene and control them with like economic policy making. And the, I think the book is broken up into two different sections. In the first one, the authors go over the five main animal spirits which are confidence, the desire for fairness, corruption, a concept called money illusion, which has to do with inflation. And the last one is the importance of stories. And in the second half of the book, the authors um, discuss eight different questions about the economy, and they emphasize how important it is to take animal spirits into account. Some of the questions that they address are why recessions happen, why we have central banks, the trade-offs between unemployment and inflation, and then why we as people don't always consider the future rationally. And I picked this book for the Boutis Financial Book Club because I wanted to take a deeper dive into understanding behavioral finance. As financial planners, I think it's important that we remember that everyone sees money in the world differently. I know Mark, John, and even Kira, we have conversations about that every week. Yeah, I think I think it's timely. I mean, we're two years into a, a global pandemic where everyone's emotions are running high. Uh, but then also we have the first land war basically since World War II in, in Europe. And people are, you know, obviously worried about that or emotions are tied to that. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of us get caught up in the the numbers and, in, in the, you know, the quantitative analysis of what we do. But yeah, you're right. It's, um, the, and, and I think the authors are right too, the emotions and the psychology and the behavioral finance aspect of it is is just is important. So where do we where do we start? Yeah, I'll start with my first question for Kira. Kira, did you have any prior knowledge about behavioral finance before reading the book? So it's interesting to anyone listening, just to give you context, I am the only person on the team that does not have a professional background in finance. Um, I'm the marketing specialist at Bowdoin Financial. 
So um, my background is definitely geared towards marketing and even some background in journalism, writing, that kind of a thing. So I've never taken, say, an educational course in finance. I've never taken economics, macroeconomics. So um, I, on the surface, I would say, no, I don't have any prior knowledge. But that said, at Boutis Financial, we do have a variety of different content that we produce on our blog, on our uh, YouTube channel, um, and otherwise. And both Mark and John have t- touched on behavioral finance before. So just in indulging in that content um, and then also sharing it out, I do have some basic knowledge of it. Um, I know that there are different techniques that are that have their own termed names, but definitely my knowledge was pretty basic going into this. And going in without a finance background, did you have a hard time reading it or was it like easier to understand as you got through it? I would say the, the first two chapters or so weren't so challenging. And then I felt like I got to a point where the authors were referencing either terminology or events that I just didn't have a basic knowledge of. And I therefore would have to like look them up or probably just skim over and try to just understand it otherwise without understanding the context behind. So it was challenging. I do still think that I understood the main takeaways of the book. Um, But when it came to the nitty gritty, it was definitely hard. Yeah, there were a lot of details in there. My next question is for Mark. The first half of the book is outlined into five different aspects that we went over, which were confidence, the desire for fairness, corruption, money illusion, and then the importance of stories. Which one of those stood out to you the most? So I, I guess one of the things I liked about the book is that they they had a lot of stories and that they related those stories to events and to economic topics. Um, I'm going to cheat here and give you two two of the five because the first one that jumped out was fairness. They they give the story of uh, you know an upcoming snowstorm and a hardware store raising the price on shovels. And in some ways, you can equate that to things going on now, whether it's a gas station raising the price of gas, but like from the economics point of view, you would say that's part of the law of su- supply and demand, right? If there's a demand for something, there's the ability to raise the price on it. But what the book talks about is no, people believe in fairness. Um, so they don't like when, you know, they, they, and you can see it even like now in current events, they, you know, if a gas station raises their price, it's not supply and demand, it's price gouging, they call it. So the first thing that jumped out was was the, the whole concept of fairness. But I think even the topic I like more, the subject I like more was money illusion. Um, and really, I like this because they give the example of the person who has a $50,000 bond portfolio, right? And they look at it and say, okay, I have 50,000. And they know how much that, you know, they always look at that statement and it'll show 50,000, 50,000. And they'll get their interest, you know, from that bond that comes in. Why it's relative to what's going on now is they don't take inflation into account. So there's the whole purchasing. What what can that 50000 buy you if inflation goes up? And the reality is it can buy you a lot less. And and that's really you know something that we can apply to today where, yeah, no one likes risk. No one likes seeing that they started at 50000 and then next month it's 40000 or whatever. But even if you put it in a bond portfolio where the principal still says 50000 you're still taking on, in this case, purchasing power risk um, or inflation risk where it's just another type of risk. Maybe the, the market value of the bond stays the same, but it's worth less. It's not a, it won't actually be able to purchase the same amount. And that's probably just one example of money illusion. But I think those two kind of the fairness aspect and the money illusion were the two that really stuck out um, as I was reading it. Yeah, I agree. I think those stuck out to me the most as well. I was trying to think of like real examples for all of these that like I've witnessed myself. And for fairness, when I was in college, I used to be a DoorDash driver. So I would deliver people food for some extra money. And when it was raining or there was bad weather, DoorDash, Uber Eats, all of those companies would hike up the prices. Like it's on their website that they do this, yeah. but I don't know if people actually know. And if they did know, they wouldn't be happy. Yeah. And you think of it from supply and demand, the rain, weather's bad. You don't want to go out and they're going to, they're going to take, you know, I don't want to say take advantage of it, but it's how they address it. And, and it was good for them. Cause it was, the idea was that like, as a driver, it wants to pull you into the areas. So you as the driver are making more money, yeah. but the person getting the food is paying more. And I, and I know that's what Uber Eats and, and DoorDash have said. They said, it's not, we're not trying to price gouge. We're trying to bring more drivers out 
you know, the drivers are probably in the same boat. It's bad weather. They don't want to be driving in bad weather. This is really to try and incentivize them to, to get out there. Yeah. Were there any quotes that you liked from the book, Mark, and why? Yeah. So a couple of quotes stuck out. Um, one of them wasn't an actual quote by the authors, but they, in the, the subject of confidence, they talk about Jack Welch and they, they bring up one of his quotes where he, he basically said he has little use for rational analytical business plans and projections. He said he made his major business decisions, um, which were he called them straight from the gut. And I know Welch's leadership style can be polarizing to people, but it really goes to show how not everything is quantitative. And now no one, you know, not everyone is looking at a spreadsheet. And then the, ex- the subsequent example they give is during the crisis of 2008, 2009, it was really a crisis of confidence where the banks didn't think that they were going to ever going to get paid, repaid their loans. So they just stopped making them. And it basically brought the economy to a halt or brought the financial sector to a halt. And, you know, they really are tying it to how important confidence is. And we see it on both sides. We see overconfidence sometimes, and then we see the, the reverse under underconfidence or lack of confidence, but both have an impact on how people react to things, whether it is, um, you know, something with the markets or economy or just straight in business decisions like like Welch brought up. Yeah, I think even in the beginning of the book, in the first chapter, the authors emphasized that understanding confidence is one of the most important things to understand about the economy. Yeah. Uh, my next question is for John. Do you think that incorporating animal spirits into the study of macroeconomic theory would be a more realistic depiction of how the world works? Well, I think my answer is yes and no, unfortunately. The reason being is I think that there is a place for, there's certainly the place for the the, the quantifiable facts, as as you guys have already mentioned, in studying macroeconomics. You know, there's, there's certainly a place for that. But it's hard to argue that there isn't a place for animal spirits in that conversation as well. Um, you know, I think the problem becomes that the animal spirits aspect of this is hard to quantify. And for instance, like if you have a graph supply and demand, how, how do you add this <laughs> factor of, of animal spirits to that conversation? So, you know, I, th- I think that um, I don't think we'll ever necessarily be able to quantify those things and not just quantify them, but, you know, we're just so complex as humans it's almost like predicting the weather when it comes to some of these, these, even some of the stories that, you know, like Mark said, they're just really, really interesting to see these stories about how different, differently the, the economy has reacted in, in fairly similar situations. But, you know, a lot of it has to do with all these layers that exist in the economy, but also we, we're just so complex as humans. You know, we have emotion, rationality, which I'll get to in a second. And, you know, it, it's really hard to understand you know, what level, for instance, if there is a time where there's a high confidence, you know, maybe they have a, a, a measure of what the confidence is, but what is truly going on? How much is it affecting what you're seeing is going to be really, really hard to, to understand. But, you know, I do think we need to look at the numbers and take some of what we've learned about human behavior um, and really give it serious consideration when we're looking at the numbers. You know, I use, use the example, they talk about the, um, you know, the, the interest rate and the and inverted the inverted curve and, and how it might predict certain things or certain things that predict things in, in the um, in the economy, but they don't always predict things, you know, and, and that to me, that's the perfect example of like, oh, you know, these signs are pointing to a possibility of a, a recession and, and the recession never shows up. But we always need to be considering how these human emotions are going to be affecting what we might see in, in the study of the macroeconomic factors, like you said. And it's just like it's almost like predicting the weather. You know, we only have so much bandwidth to take in some of these considerations and say, hey, look, this is this is what we think is going to happen. But, you know, there's also A, B, C and D that, that could affect this, that, that might put us within a, a degree of uncertainty. So. Yeah, I think that, that that kind of brings me to that that reason why it's like yes or no. It's like I just think that there's a place for both of them, but in my mind, they're hard to mix together. Definitely, that's a good point. Because throughout the book, I think they just mainly explain why they're important, but there was really no solution as to like how it should be incorporated going forward. Yeah, like I have this written down: the economy doesn't always function rationally. And if we had factored turbulent emotions into economic theory, we might not have boom-bust cycles. 
But how would we factor that in? Because that's the whole reason why animal spirits have that animalistic aspect to it. So it's something I was wondering as well. Yeah, that brings me to my next question for you, Kira. Were there any parts of the book that you disliked or disagreed with? I wouldn't say that there was anything that I disagreed with, but I think it was more because I approached this as like me trying to learn from the authors and therefore I didn't actually have the knowledge base to have this way of disagreeing with it. Like I didn't have a knowledge base that would go against what they're saying. So therefore this was more of like a knowledgeable experience for me. I was just learning from reading it. I did already sort of mention this, but I think going into reading this book, you should have a baseline understanding of macroeconomics because I think it would probably make it easier and um, more applicable to you so that's the only thing that I sort of wish I had going into it. Awesome and then John did anything in the book surprise you? Actually what surprised me is almost related to the last question you had for me in in a sense that it really surprised me how some economists take the numbers so literal and just really they get caught up in the numbers and the graphs and don't consider that There's so many complexities, like I said already, about us as human beings, and not to mention that there's like the the social aspects of it and the differences between, let's say, for instance, just the different areas across the country. During the pandemic, I live in Florida. It was amazing to me how different things were in the Northeast than they were down in in Florida, right? So the mentality was, was very, very different. You know, when you take a macro approach, it's foolish to not think that it's like, so many things that are different and to just look, look at the numbers is only taking you halfway. The second part of this is, is like how political the numbers can be sometimes. Um, the interpretation, the political interpretation. I mean, it's no mystery that sometimes we, we see or hear or are drawn to the things that we almost want to believe. So you see throughout the book, this push and pull between Milton Friedman and, and, uh, and Keynesian or whatever the, you know, the, com- the competing economists are in the conversation. And there's almost like this political drive between the two of them. So you're, you're almost sometimes uh, coming up with the conclusion first and then just trying to find the numbers that'll support it. It was apparent to me throughout the book how, you know, there's almost like these two teams and they're, they're playing against each other. And they're saying, well, no, like this is this and this is that. But at the end of the day, the numbers are numbers, like the numbers don't lie. And I think that that, that leads solidifies my first point is that, you know, we're so complex that the fact that we can take the same numbers, we have access to the same numbers, formulate them in a way that like they're, they're giving you opposite outcomes or, you know, opposite opinions leads me to believe that like the, the one deciding factor is the fact that we have these animal spirits and these rationality and, uh, and emotion that really drives a lot of this confidence being another one. Yeah, I think you hit on a lot of my thoughts, John. One of the things that I thought about when reading the book was that, like you said, there was a political element to it. These politicians and elected officials, they have their own animal spirits that they're bringing with them. So that does take it into account. But I don't really think that the authors mentioned that. No, and and the shame is, is, is really we should be pulling both sides together. Because I do think that like the Friedman and the Keynes like ideas, there's a truth to both, like both sides, you know, fortunately it's, it's evident in a lot of the mirrors of our lives. Like we just were drawn towards one. And when it comes to certain areas of economics, I just don't think that there's really, really room for that, but it's an unfortunate reality, I guess. Yeah. All right. Those were all the questions that I had for you guys. I'll let you wrap it up, Mark. All right. So actually we'll wrap it up and we'll give you another question. So you picked it. Um, anything surprise you about it? Any, you know, any other thoughts that you had on the book after reading it? Not to steal John's answer, but I was surprised by the political stuff. I think that kind of came through at the end. I think that the book kind of was divided into two sections. I enjoyed the first half more, which broke down the five important animal spirits. And then the second half was just trying to tie that together and use those to answer more complex questions. I enjoyed the first half more. So I was kind of surprised that my interest kind of fell off. So I think the book is like 10 years old and, you know, we've had many things go on and whether it's the economy or just in in general, do you think those principles still hold true to what you're seeing now? I think some of it does. And I think we need to continue to consider the animal spirits moving forward because both Keynes and these authors wrote this after Keynes was came after the Great Depression and then 
these guys were during the financial crisis. So human emotions were at an all time high at those points. So I think it's important to consider that. But I do think that there is truth to both sides, like John was mentioning. Yeah. Okay. So Kayla, thank you for hosting today's show. So we each actually picked a book. We had Atomic Habits. Uh, there was a book on Elon Musk, one from Simon Sinek, and then this one. So we'll pick our next one. If any listeners have any book that they think would be a good one for us to review, send it in. We're happy to to take that. Otherwise, we'll pick a pick another one. So we, you know, they're kind of on a range of of different topics. Not necessarily. I mean, this one was probably as economics heavy as as the other ones. And and Kier, I think you know, to you starting it off. Even, you know, with us being in the financial industry, it wasn't the easiest of reads to go through, I think. And that's just, the I think, the way uh, economists write or how they look at things. Um, but yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll wrap it up. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Thank you for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Boutis Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial planning and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investments and financial planning. 